Today, we'll have Julie's European trip, including the Olympics and Disneyland Paris and a lot more. That's coming up on this episode 424 of WW Prep to Go. Hello and welcome to WW Prep to Go, where we talk strategy and ideas for people planning their Disney World trip. I am your host, Shannon Albert from www.prepschool.com. Thank you for being here for episode 424. Today is a, another trip report, and it's a fun one because, well, they're all fun ones, I guess. But uh, Julie went to Paris, London, and Ireland, and all parts sound really fun to me. But the Paris part specifically included the Olympics and Disneyland Paris. So you'll get all that information in just a minute. As always, if you want to be a podcast guest like Julie, the only way to do that is using SpeakPipe, which is linked in the show notes of every episode leave a voicemail with your trip details and if it works with our schedule somebody on my team will reach out to you to get it booked and a reminder to follow on social media if you aren't already because we try to keep everybody updated on the latest and greatest and also give you little peeks from the park as we visit or a member of my team who is in orlando visits a few times a week etc I was going to say that's it for housekeeping. The next episode or the next updates that you hear after this episode will be for us at at Disney World for the Food and Wine Festival. So that will be coming up next and we'll have, you know, daily posts to tell you what has been good or not so good. And we will also be attending the Halloween party, staying in a treehouse at Saratoga Springs Resort, etc. So lots of things to look forward to. But for now, here are my chats with Julie. Welcome to Podcast Julie. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much. So excited to be here. We are talking on Friday afternoon, July 12th, and I understand that you are headed overseas. I am, yes. So we leave on Wednesday, July 24th for an overnight trip to Paris, and we're doing Paris, London, and a couple days in Ireland. Okay, so it's not just Paris. It's Paris, London, Ireland. Okay. And is this uh, part of a group trip or did you plan all the legs of it? I planned all the legs of it. So the the purpose of it is to go to the Olympics. That's the main reason that we're going this time of year. And it's my wife and I, and we always go on a couple trip couples trip with my best friend and her husband. So the four of us will do the Paris leg together. And then my wife and I will finish off the rest of the trip in London and Ireland. Okay. That (laughs) is very exciting. So before we get into the day-to-day plans, what is it starts July 24th with your flight? And then when does it end? When do you get home? And then we get back on August 7th. Oh, okay. Nice long trip. Yeah. Okay. And you said you're going with another couple friends. We um, are. Yep. For part, at least part of that trip. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Okay. So July 24th is a Wednesday. Yep. So we depart Seattle on a overnight flight. It's a direct flight to Charles de Gaulle. And we land on Thursday morning, the 25th in Paris at 9 a.m. And then since our hotel won't be ready yet, uh, we're staying in the city in a hotel, just like a little boutique hotel that we found. Uh, And so we'll probably just drop our bags that morning and then do some exploring while we wait for our friends to arrive. They land in the afternoon at 2.10. Okay. Friends arrive in the afternoon. Now, with, coming from Seattle, you have a lot of uh, big time change. Yes. Big time change. It is, I think, uh, nine hours diff- time difference. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, that's what I would guess. Yeah. So it'll, it'll feel like midnight when we land, but it'll be 9am. So, but going to try to stay up all day. And that way, by the time we go to bed on Thursday night, when we wake up Friday morning, hopefully we're somewhat adjusted to the time change. Yes. That is going to be the tough part, but you're going to, 
You've got a strategy there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So July 25th, Thursday, you land in the morning. You're staying at a boutique hotel. I believe you said you're dropping your bags. Your friends arrive in the afternoon. Uh, what else on this day, July 25th? Yeah. So my brother is actually also going to be there. He works for USA Fencing. He is in their communication on their communications team. And so he will be there for the duration of the Olympics. So we're hoping to be able to meet him for dinner before things start to get busy for him with all of the fencing turn or fencing matches that'll happen. So I'm still seeking out reservations. A couple of the places that we want to potentially have dinner that night don't open for reservation until like one to 10 days out. So still kind of stalking their websites to make those reservations as soon as they become available. Isn't it hard when you're used to Disney world? Yes. You're like open sooner. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm used to that 60 day mark, but that is not the case with some of these places, especially like in this case with the Olympics, how far out did you have to plan certain elements of the trip? Well, a lot of it we've been planning for like 12 to 18 months. Like we made our, uh, uh, spoiler alert, we're doing Disneyland Paris as part of this, mm -hmm. but uh, we made those reservations like 12 months ago. So a lot mm -hmm. of stuff has been already in flight for a long time. Yeah, that's that's what I assumed when yeah. you, you were doing the Olympics. Because <laughs> yep. it's like, wow, that takes some planning. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So maybe some restaurants reservations, you just can't make them yet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll just do a little bit of sightseeing that day while we wait for my friends and then just kind of hang out and see where the day takes us and hopefully have dinner somewhere that we have a reservation for because we're expecting it to be very crowded. Yes. <laughs> I'm expecting it to be as well. Yep. I'd be very interested to see uh, how it goes for you. Yeah. Okay. And then what is, what are your plans right now for Friday, July 26th? So Friday morning, we have a food tour. It's, we booked it through Eating Paris and it's called their Left Bank Food and Wine Tour. And that's from 9.30 to 12.30. And there's, I think like five or six stops that we'll make on the food tour. And I love doing food tours when we go to like foreign cities, just to kind of get a local taste of mm -hmm. places that we may not have known about. So we'll do that in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we sort of saved that to be able to explore some of the Olympic like gift shops and potentially just kind of see the ambiance of the area in and around where the opening ceremony is going to be. It's actually going to take place on the Seine. We don't have tickets to the opening ceremonies. Those were out of our budget, but just kind of get a feel for the Olympics and, and how that's all going and, you know, just kind of soak it in. And then that night, we actually have a dinner reservation at a restaurant that is along the Sin. I don't know if where that restaurant is will allow us any sort of view, but we thought we'd maximize our effort and make a reservation. So that restaurant is called Basset, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, and it's right, right along the river. Okay. And your brother working for USA Fencing, does he get to go to the opening oh, yeah. ceremonies? Uh, not the opening ceremonies, actually. No, he said that those tickets for media are saved for like, you know, the NBC anchors and like the big, the big time folks. So he gets to go to any sporting event that he wants, but not the opening ceremonies. Okay. Okay. And then July 27th, Saturday. Yeah. So then Saturday, we have a ticketed timed and ticketed entrance to the Louvre at 1030. So we'll do that in the morning. And then we have a early dinner reservation, like probably four o'clock at Angelina. And, or I'm sorry, that is not a reservation. They don't take reservations. We're planning to wait like a half an hour there. So we'll plan to arrive around like 3 30 
wait for the half hour and dine there for an early dinner because we have a champagne cruise on the river at 630. And then we have to be back to the Eiffel Tower by nine o'clock because we're seeing beach volleyball that night and the match starts at 10 p.m. Okay. <laughs> be back for my champagne cruise for the yeah. Eiffel Tower <laughs> to see the Olympic beach volleyball. Yeah. You know, just as one just, does. Yeah, just, you know, a, just a, your ordinary Saturday night. No big deal. Yeah. Okay, so. but let's talk. So... I don't know much about how you get tickets to these events. So like, is this an event that you purposely chose? Was it some sort of lottery? How does that work? Yeah. So when tickets opened for the different uh, events, Mm -hmm. there was, you could buy like a grouping of tickets. And so we did a, basically a three event grouping. And so we selected our three events based on what was available and you, you sort of enter into like a queue and then they tell you like, okay, your queue has opened up. Now you have this window of time to go in and purchase your tickets. And then, and there at that point, there were still several events available. And so you can kind of pick and choose based on your budget. Some things were out of our budget, like gymnastics. Mm-hmm but other things were not like beach volleyball. And so we just sort of pick and chose so that we would have something like one thing a day is sort of how it ended up, ended up taking, taking shape. Mm -hmm. And then we just, yeah, picked so we could kind of have a variety and see, see several different things. Okay. And on this day, it just happens to be beach volleyball. Yeah. And I have no idea if this is true or not, but I think it's at night because I'm assuming that the sand gets hot because it's outdoors. And so I think that's why they do it at night. But I could have totally just made that up in my head. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've i watched beach volleyball a lot in previous Olympics and I, I it has been during the day. So true. Yeah. I yeah. Know. I don't know. We'll see. But it is, I don't know if you've seen like they, so there's, they've shown like the different venues and it's like literally under the Eiffel Tower. So that's going to be pretty cool. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty excited. I haven't seen anything except for the Olympic symbol on the Eiffel Tower. That's okay. It. Okay. So, you know, I'll be tuning in and seeing yeah, it on, for sure. on t- TV. Okay. So July 28th is, is a Sunday. Yep. So then that morning, because we anticipate it'll be a pretty late night with the volley- beach volleyball not starting till 10, we don't have anything planned until 11. And at 11, we plan to line up for this restaurant. Uh, and I'm totally not going to pronounce this correctly, but it's Les Relais de Les Entrecotes. And it's known for their steak and frites. And it's my best friend and her husband's favorite place that they've ever eaten at in Paris. They also don't take reservations. So we plan to be there at 11. They open at noon and we'll have lunch there. And then we have the Musée de l'Orangerie, which is where the water lilies are. And we have a ticketed and timed entrance there for 2 p.m. And everything that I've read there says that you can really be in and out of there in like 45 minutes to an hour. It's a pretty small museum. So we'll do that. At what time did you say that was? Oh, sorry. That's at 2. Okay. And then... From there, we will get on the train, and it's a 45-minute train ride to the Parc des Princes Arena, where we're seeing soccer for the night. And that soccer game starts at 5 p.m. Okay. All right. Soccer that day? Yep. And, like... Relative to the Eiffel Tower, where is this arena? Like how spread out are these different like venues? They are super spread out. So like my my brother where he's staying and like where the fencing arena is, is mm-hmm. six miles from where we are at our hotel. And then this arena is like at another course, like another part of Paris and like, an, you know, a completely different section than the arena. 
for fencing. So they're pretty spread out all, all throughout like central Paris and then the surrounding area. And then ironically enough, my cousin um, works for USA Surfing and surfing is actually happening in Tahiti. So that's like really far away. <laughs> That is more than a 45 minute train ride. That is definitely more than a 45 minute train. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. So then we're at Monday, July 29th. Yeah. So then Monday morning, again, nothing, nothing super early, uh, but another 40 minute train ride to the La Defense Arena, which as I understand it is where Taylor Swift had her concert. My wife is a huge Swifty, so I know she's just excited to like be in the presence of where Taylor Swift was. And so that's where we're seeing swimming. And that starts at 11. So we won't do anything in the morning other than probably grab breakfast at a cafe or something and then hop on the train to be up there by about 10. My my goal is that we're at each of the venues like an hour before they start to just get through security and get settled in before, you know, the event actually takes place. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of your uh, Disney planning skills must have come in handy for some of this. Definitely are. Yes. Because you talked about cues and lining up and there's like, there's a lot of strategy for this, obviously. Yeah, for sure. And I am usually like, so we do an annual trip, like I mentioned with our friends and I always create my spreadsheet and Mm -hmm. have like, you know, hour by hour. And they're like, I mean, obviously Julie's going to make us our trip spreadsheet and then send Mm -hmm. it to all of us. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. listen, you got to have one of us in your group. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. What are you doing Um, after the swimming event? So then that's when we take the train to Disneyland Paris. So we will have checked out of our hotel that morning and left our bags with the the bellman. And then so we'll go back to our hotel, grab our bags, and then hop on the train to Disneyland Paris. It's about a 45-minute-ish train ride. And then that evening, we have... Uh, dinner reservations at Waltz at 7.30. And because the way Disneyland Paris does their tickets, we have a three-night hotel reservation and that came with four-day tickets. Mm -hmm. So we actually have this first day that we can go into the park. So that's why we're going to have dinner at Waltz is because we have sort of this like free day uh, that we, you know, use it or lose it kind of thing. So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. And where are you staying? So we are staying at the, the Avengers hotel, the hotel, New York. Okay. All right. And then seven 30 reservation at Waltz. Anything after that? No, I mean, in this case, I'm asking, cause I know they have that really late drone show. So we're planning to see that later on in our stay. We have like the reserved tickets for that or the Mm -hmm. reserved seating. Maybe we'll see. My best friend's husband is actually like he's staying at the hotel with us, but he's not doing any of the Disney stuff. He's going to go do some wine tasting on his own. But because his the reservation comes with tickets for him too, like if he wants to do anything that night, We'll kind of cater to what he wants to do. If there's any rides he might want to ride, since that'll be his only time in the park. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then Tuesday, July 30th. So that day, the parks both open at 8.30 for extra magic time for on-site guests. And so we plan to rope drop Walt Disney Studios that day. And then just do some some touring. I'm sort of treating this more like a Disneyland trip. Like I don't really have like a specific touring plan planned out because I don't really know what to expect and kind of getting the lay of the land. We do have the premier access passes so that we can get to, you know, the front of the lines for all of the rides that are part of that grouping. I... I hesitated a lot on whether I wanted those passes, but with how crowded I'm expecting it to be just Mm -hmm. in and around Paris at that time, I was like, this feels like a good investment and I don't want to wait in line. So we bit the bullet and decided to go ahead and get those. 
Did you have any trouble getting like hotel or dining reservations? No. And, you know, I, we booked the Disneyland portion also a year ago and it Mm -hmm. was so weird. I like, I've heard other trip reports that have Mm -hmm. been to Disneyland Paris and have said, you know, that they did their dining at 60 days out. I was able to book my dining a year ago. I have no idea why. I don't know if there was a glitch in the system or what, but I booked all my dining a year ago. So. It's possible they changed the rules during the Olympics. Oh, maybe. You think? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't I know like, anything, but yeah. Big, yeah. Big guess. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't know how I got so lucky, but I'm not going to complain about it. So yeah, we, we didn't have any issues getting our dining because I, I don't think anybody was thinking about it a year ago. So yeah. Well, I, yeah, a year out. You're like, what am I going to be hungry for in a year? Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I had read several blogs and like, I've heard that, you know, the food is not the same as Mm -hmm. it is at at Disney World or Disneyland. And so I was sort of like, you know, kind of going into it with minimal expectations, but I had read several blogs and reserved places based on like those reviews because I've never been to Disneyland Paris either. So it'll be my first time. So lots of new things to learn. So you've talked about touring and using premier access passes on this day. Do you have anything else planned? So we have lunch at Pim's test kitchen at 1215. And that is a dining reservation. So made that one. And then after lunch, plan to hop over to Disneyland and do a little bit of touring in the afternoon there before going back to the hotel to take an afternoon break. And then we have dinner at the Manhattan restaurant reserved back at our hotel at 7 p.m. And then after that is when we have the reserved viewing for Disney Illuminations, and they recommend that you r- arrive 30 minutes before the showtime. And so there's the Illuminations, and then there's also the pre-show, which I think is the drone show, and then the Illuminations is the castle show. Okay. And they stay open till 11 that night so far. Very confusing that they call it illumination. I know. <laughs> and and like, isn't the Pim's Test Kitchen is a table service? Table service, yeah. Whereas, that's... you know, in California, it's it's quick service. Anyway. <laughs> yep, I know, I know. So many, I was like, wait, I can make a reservation here? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to keep it all straight. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Next day, Wednesday, yeah. July 31st. Yep. So parks open same time that day, 830. So we plan to rope drop Disneyland Park this morning and then do some touring in the morning. We have premier access again on this day. And then we're planning on a quick service lunch at either Toad Hall, Market House Deli, or Casa de Coco just kind of depending on what our mood is. There wasn't really any other dining reservations that I had read that we would really want. So I figured good opportunity to try out one of the quick service options. And then we'll take our afternoon break and then come back and go to Walt Disney Studios Park for the afternoon. And then that evening, we have dinner at Chez Remy at 6.30. And then depending on like if there's things that we haven't seen or things that we want to repeat, we'll do that. But also kind of planning that that might be an earlier night because we all, we all have early departures the next morning. Okay. We are what halfway through your trip or something like that. (laughs) And (laughs) I'm, I'm pre-tired for you. Yeah. (laughs) Because I know there's still lots more to come. So what do you have an early morning uh, doing on August 1st, Thursday? Yes. So August 1st, we, so that's when we say bye to our friends. And so Chelsea and I will catch the train back into the city. And then we will catch our Eurostar train to take us to London at 
it, it departs at 9 12. Uh, and it is a two hour train ride, but because of the time change, we actually arrive in London at 10 30. And then we will take a lift to our London hotel. We're staying at a Marriott in London near the London Eye. And so we'll take a lift to our hotel, drop our bags off, and then find somewhere to have lunch. Uh, tentatively, there's a place called Mother Mash that I've been to before in London that I love. It's just like a counter service restaurant that's really delicious and has like, you know, like the meat pies and stuff like that. And then that afternoon, we have a ticketed entry to a museum called the Frameless Museum. And we fell victim to an Instagram ad for this one. But it's like you walk into a room and you're like the painting is like on the ceiling and on the walls and on the ground. And you're like, and it's it's a live painting. So like the one that was on the Instagram ad looked like you were standing in the middle of the ocean and there's just like waves coming up around you and on the walls and the ceiling. So we'll see if it's cool. It looks really neat. And some of the paintings that come to life look really cool. So listen, those Instagram and Facebook ads they, work sometimes. They get you. They what totally what get time you. is your entry for this? Because I know you have, you said you have tickets. Yeah. So we it's, a, it's actually a flexible entry. So we can enter anytime between 12 and 4. Okay. Can't enter. I'm taking lots of notes. That's yeah. <laughs> okay. And then that evening, we have another food tour through the same company. This, this time, however, it's called Eating London. And this is their Twilight Soho food tour. Uh, and on this particular tour, they take you, again, to a lot of really cool, like, hole-in-the-wall places. There's also some, like, craft cocktails that are incorporated into the tour. So that'll be how we eat dinner that night is on this food tour. Okay. That sounds fun. Yeah. All right. Is that the end of August 1st? It is. Yep. Okay. And now we're on Friday, August 2nd. Yep. So on this day, we have a tour booked through Golden Tours to take the train out to Windsor Castle. And it's a flexible tour. So we have a timed ticket for the train itself, but then we can enter Windsor Castle at any point and then do the touring at our own pace. So we'll plan to do that. Our our ticket for the train departs at 921. And then when, once we get to Windsor, we'll just explore the castle at our leisure. I did make us lunch reservations at the Royal Windsor Pub for noon. So I'm figuring, you know, spend a couple hours at the castle and then go into walk into the town of Windsor to have lunch and maybe explore the town a little bit if we feel like it. But the only, we don't really have anything else the rest of the day. So we can stay in Windsor if we want, or if we're feeling like we're done, we'll head back into London via the train. And that's an open return time on that train ticket. And then we'll spend the afternoon exploring Harrods, maybe go to Fortnum and Mason if we want. And then I would really like to go to the Victoria and Albert's Museum if we have time as well. And that is an open, open entry. It's a free museum, so we can go anytime. Okay. The, the Victoria and Albert's, you just reminded me that I want, I have this idea to like create content based on Disney World things and oh, what, yes. what they really are, you know, so Victoria and Albert's. Victoria yeah. And Albert's. I totally didn't even make that connection. You're so right. That'd be really yeah. cool. Yeah. I just think it's interesting to look at why Disney, you know, where they pulled it from. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's not, it's not just made up. Right. Right. So, okay. Saturday, August 3rd. Yeah. So then that day we are going to explore the borough market in the morning. So it's just basically like a giant market, lots of food vendors, things like that. So wake up and just enjoy 
enjoy our time there and be pretty casual. And then the only reservation that we have for that day at this point is high tea at the Roseberry, which is at the um, Duran Oriental Hotel. Um, and that's at 1245. So we'll, you know, kind of take the morning as it comes, then go to high tea. And then that afternoon, if we want to just, you know, walk by Buckingham Palace and see what we see there, maybe go into Hyde Park. And that afternoon and the previous afternoon are, I feel like are kind of interchangeable also depending on the weather. Like if it's rainy, if it, if we expect it to be rainy, one of the days, then we would do Hyde Park on the day that it's hopefully not rainy. So, Mm -hmm. okay. And then Sunday morning, we have an early flight to Dublin. So our flight leaves at 8.50 and we land in Dublin at 10.15 So once we get into Dublin, we did rent a car. So we'll see how driving on the opposite side of the car and the opposite side of the road goes for Chelsea, not me. I will not be driving. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then uh, we have a Dublin big bus tour booked for that day to just kind of see the sights because we're not spending a ton of time in Dublin. It'll just be for like that. So we'll hit the sights see what we want to see. And then from there, we're actually driving about an hour and a half outside of Dublin to stay in Athlone, I think is maybe how you pronounce it, because that will cue us up to be really close to the Cliffs of Moher, which is where we're going the next day. So that's that day is just the bus tour and then making our way to our hotel in the middle of the country. Okay. (laughs) Really curious about that. Okay. It's such a a good mix of like touristy and local. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've heard great things about Dublin and also because we will be spending so much time in London, I was like, I really want to get out and see Ireland because this will be both of our first time in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been to London and Paris before. And so I was like, I just, I mean, the Cliffs of Moher, obviously like total bucket list items. So I was like, I feel like because we will have gotten our fill of city time in both London and Paris, that getting out and like seeing the countryside will, will be in, we'll be ready for that at that point, I think. Yeah, definitely a change of scenery. Yeah, for sure. Okay. I just Googled to make sure I could spell more correctly. Yes. <laughs> M-O-H-E-R. Yep. As if anyone's going to be spell checking my notes. Right. <laughs> okay. So the next day, Monday, August 5th, is you said you will be doing the Cliffs of more. Yeah. So it's about another hour drive. We can also, if we want to kind of detour a little bit north of the Cliffs of more to go to Galway. I have a few friends who've been to Ireland and they said Galway is just beautiful. It's actually a sister city to Seattle. And so that just a cool little trivia fact. So if we, if we want to make our way up there too, we, we have time to do that. Our cliffs of more actually timed entrance is for 4 PM because we want to see the sunset at cliffs of more. So we, you can pre-order like a picnic dinner or picnic lunch through their like visitor center. So we have a picnic dinner and wine reserved for our evening at the Cliffs of Moher, hang out there, watch the sunset. And then, you know, depending on when we're ready to leave about an hour drive, then back to our hotel that night. Okay. Now, if you feel like getting the the sunset timing would be competitive. True. And that's why I booked. So I booked that a few weeks ago because I was having the same thought. And so that's, that's why I like had it booked so far in advance or what I had read about would be far enough in advance. So mm-hmm. that is, that is a pre-ticketed time entry that we have is that 4 PM. Okay. And and you had to run a car because that's the only way to get to and from this area. I exactly. Yep. Okay. Now we're on Tuesday, August 6th. Yep. So then this is our last day. So we will wake up 
and check out of our hotel, planning to leave the hotel around 730 so we can get back into Dublin. And there's a bakery called Bread 41 that I want to try to get to for breakfast that morning. And then we will depart for the airport at noon return our rental car and then our flights leave Dublin at 3:20 p.m. and and now I'm realizing that I said that we come back on the 7th but that it'll be the 7th in Dublin by the time we land back in mm-hmm. Seattle but it'll still be the 6th for us so we land at 5:01 p.m. so just 2 2 hours later even though it'll actually be 9 hours later <laughs> Yeah, 5.01 p.m. Seattle time. Yep, on the 6th. Yes, (laughs) on the 6th. So you have the 7th available. We do, yeah. Now we have a recovery day. (laughs) Yes. Okay. All right, well, what an incredible trip. Yeah, I'm super, super excited. We haven't done a big trip like this since our honeymoon. We went to Australia and Fiji and did that for two weeks. So i um, excited to do another, another trip, like a big, long overseas trip like this. So I love doing these trip reports that include Disney elements, but then also include a lot more because they, hopefully it helps people figure out how they could put it together. Yeah, totally. To, because some of the elements of your trip sound familiar to previous trip reports, but a lot of it is new as well. So yeah, yeah, that'll be yeah, fun. I'm excited. All right. Well, have an incredible time and thank I'll- you talk to you in August. Okay. All right. Thanks, Shannon. Have a good day. Summer's just around the corner and it's time to give your skin the care it deserves. Osea has just the thing. Their best-selling Andaria Algae Body Oil. Osea has been making seaweed-infused products that are safe for your skin and the planet for nearly 30 years. Their products are clean, vegan, cruelty-free, climate-neutral certified, and born in California. So you never have to choose between your values and your best skin. To create their next level body care product, Osea soaks hand harvested Andaria seaweed in barrels and botanical oils, including passion fruit and acai. The result is a rich body oil that absorbs in minutes and won't leave you feeling greasy. It's clinically proven to instantly improve skin elasticity and deliver deep moisturization. And with a scent like a citrusy vacation, you'll feel like you're sitting poolside with smooth, silky soft, glowing skin. Get 10% off your first order site-wide with code GLOW at OSEAMalibu.com. That's O-S-E-A Malibu.com, code GLOW. Everyone deserves to be connected. That's why Cox offers a range of high-speed internet plans that fit any budget. Stream, chat, and stay connected at an incredible price. It's fast, reliable internet for everyone. You're probably thinking, wait, what? But yeah, it's true. Learn more at Cox.com slash ACP. Non-transferable, one per household. Application and eligibility decisions are made by the FCC. Other restrictions apply. Welcome back from your trip, Julie. Thanks, Shannon. Excited to be talking to you and to be back. We're talking on Saturday, August 17th, which means you've been back for about a week and a half, I think it is. Yeah. We were supposed to talk a little sooner, but you came back with an unwanted souvenir. Yes, we both came back with colds, but feeling a lot better now. So I'm happy that they passed quickly and that it wasn't COVID. (laughs) Yes, that is nice too. Um, Yeah. You you have an unfortunate situation that so many do after trips, but I'm glad you're doing better. Um, But overall, how did your trip go before you got sick? Oh, it was fantastic. We had a really great time. Um, Several things changed from what we had originally planned, but all in all, it was a great trip and um, we really enjoyed ourselves. Okay. Well, this is going to help fill my post-Olympic void. Yes, indeed. I know I'm already missing the Olympics for sure. So yeah, I don't know what to do with myself now that that, that's gone, but let's start at the beginning, which was July 24th, Wednesday, where you were leaving Seattle and flying to Paris and landing on Thursday. Yeah, we did. And everything went off without a hitch there. Easy check-in at the airport. Uh, easy through, you know, security and customs and everything. Our flight left on time. We landed in Paris on Thursday, the 25th at 9 a.m. And it was easy through customs there too. Once we got to Paris, I think we must have been like the first international flight landing of the day because we were to baggage claim, I think by like 940 
with our bags and then headed out to the train. We were on the train at 10 a.m. So that, and that was with a stop to buy our train ticket and get our bags and all that. So super quick through security and then got to our hotel at around 1130. We got off the train and there was a little bit of a walk. And so, and walking with our bags was just a little bit slow, but our room was ready right away. So we were able to go into our room. We were in our room around noon. And then um, we really, really wanted to stay up, but we both were like, nope, we're going to take a baby nap. So (laughs) took a quick like hour and a half nap and then woke up feeling rested and ready and headed out for the afternoon. And then in the afternoon, uh, we went to the Galleries Lafayette, which is basically like a shopping center, shopping mall. And uh, they had a really cool little wine bar. And so we sat there and had a little snack and glass of champagne to kick off the trip and just explored for a little while walking around the city, just kind of getting the lay of things before uh, our friends, Ed and Courtney, arrived. And then we met them and my brother, who I had mentioned in the pre-trip was there working. So Mm -hmm. we were able, he was able to join us. We met for dinner that night at a restaurant called Brasserie Charlie and had a lovely dinner. And then we walked around that neighborhood a little bit. And then we hopped on the Metro to the Champs-Élysées where we went to lottery for dessert. And then we were back in our room by 11 o'clock to go to bed. So that was a a very busy full first day, but stayed awake as much as we could to get on Paris time, which we did the next morning. We were feeling like we were adjusted pretty well. So Okay. That's not too bad then. Yeah. Not too bad because you've had a lot of time zones to go through to get there. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Okay. That takes us to Friday, July 26th, where you had a food tour booked. Yeah. So this was so much fun. And I I know I had also mentioned in the pre-trip, we like to do food tours when we go to international cities. And this Eating Europe company is who we went through. This particular tour was called Eating Paris, and it was their left bank food and wine tour. And we met at a little cafe at 9.30, met our tour guide. Um, And it was just the four of us plus one other um, young man who is from California. And uh, our tour guide is has lived in Paris her, her whole adult life. She moved from Russia, actually, when she was like in her early 20s. And she was a fantastic tour guide. And we spent the three hours, we went to a bakery and had an apple tart. We went to a cheese shop and she got like a variety of cheeses to go. And then we stopped at a caviar shop where we sampled our cheeses and sampled like three different types of caviar and smoked salmon with wine. Uh, And then we went to a meat shop and had pork belly And then we went to a wine shop and tried some different French wines and then ended at a chocolate shop where we had chocolate mousse and we were stuck. Yeah, it was, it was really, really fun. And we were, we were like, well, we don't need lunch today. This was, and was this all by foot or did you have to get on a train? Nope. It was all by foot. So it was in the left bank neighborhood. And so she just kind of toured us all around there and then. Also part of the tour was just telling us a little bit of the history of the left bank, which was really cool. So I loved that it was like, you know, art and architecture history mixed in with all the different food stops. Mm -hmm. That's nice. A nice way to sample some local food. Yeah, indeed. It was great. So highly recommend. After that, were you able to explore Olympic shops or areas? We did. So we, we on foot went to a couple of churches as we made our way to one of the many Olympic gift shops that were kind of stationed throughout Paris. We this On this day, we didn't go to the main Olympic gift shop, but it was one of their satellite ones. 
It still had a line. We waited in line for about 30 minutes. They need to take advantage of virtual queue. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we waited for about 30 minutes and it was that particular gift shop was fine. It was pretty tiny, which is obviously why it had such a long line and such a long wait. So we didn't really find anything in that particular gift shop. But then from there, we went to the Luxembourg Gardens and they had also throughout the city at different, like different tourist uh, attractions, they would have these like Olympic structures set up. So like at the Louvre, they had Olympic rings and in the Luxembourg Gardens, they had like a Paris 2024 um, just like structure, I guess. And you could line up and take pictures there. So we did that and then sat at the little cafe in the gardens and had a glass of wine. And then from there, took the metro back to our hotel to just have like an afternoon rest and change into our Team USA gear. Mm. Yeah. And was the Team USA gear something you bought that day? Or you no, brought, brought with we you? brought, yeah, brought with us or had ordered it online, like from the Team USA shop. So, yeah. And then, so after our rest, this was probably about uh, like 6.30, we hopped on the Metro and made our way to uh, actually a Canadian pub of all things called The Moose and met one of Courtney's friends from back in the States who was also at the Olympics. Um, So we met her and her family and watched the opening ceremonies at this pub. We were probably about, I would say like five blocks off of the sin, but that was really as close as we could even get to the water because it was all blocked off with security and police and everything and like all you know all those structures to keep everybody who was not ticketed for the opening ceremonies out of that general area but we loved watching it at this pub there were people from all over the world in there and so Uh like when their countries were announced Mm -hmm. they would cheer and then people were cheering for you know like some of the smaller countries that you know probably I mean there were no fans from those countries in the pub, but we were all cheering for them anyway. And so it was just really cool, like to be surrounded by that. Cause I'm normally watching the opening ceremonies at home, you know? Mm-hmm. So this was a totally new experience. It was, that sounds really fun. So is that the dinner reservation that you had, or is that what you did instead of the dinner reservation? So actually the original dinner reservation, they canceled on us. And I think it was probably because they couldn't be open due to their proximity to the river. So this and, place and that's why you that's why you book there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And they were uh, like, whoops, we can't do that. Yeah, exactly. So this was a great alternative though. And that, you know, of course they had all their TVs on with the with the opening ceremonies playing. So it was perfect. Okay. Well, I'm glad that worked out. That sounds really fun. And definitely not how we experience it in the United States. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, uh, so that brings us to Saturday, July. 27th, where you had tickets to go to the Louvre. Yes, we did. So we started off this morning stopping at a little cafe near our hotel for breakfast and just sat and had coffee and baguettes and croissants. Felt very French. Uh, And then our ticketed and timed entrance for the Louvre was 1030. And we got there right at 1030 went through their security and scanned in with our tickets. And then we sort of split up because Chelsea and I wanted to see different things than Ed and Courtney did. And so we went our separate ways once we were in the museum and we probably stayed in the museum for about three hours, just exploring all the different things, seeing the Mona Lisa, all of that stuff. And then Chelsea and I were ready for an afternoon break. So on our way back to the hotel, we could actually walk to the Louvre from our hotel. And so on our walk back, we just stopped at a little crepe stand and grabbed some crepes and then ate those in our hotel room and took an afternoon nap 
And then Ed and Courtney did similar plans. I think they stayed in the museum a little longer than us, but then we all met back up to head to our champagne cruise at like 4.30. Mm-hmm. You're having a very French day. Yeah. A very Parisian day. Indeed. Yep. Tell us about your champagne cruise, Julie. <laughs> yeah. So it was really fun. Uh, so we we took the train, took the metro to the near the Eiffel Tower and got off there. And then it was a little bit of a walk to where we met the boat and hopped on. And it, it's a regular, like, thin cruise boat. And then if you're there for the champagne cruise, you sit in the front of the boat in like a secluded area. So there are other patrons on the boat that are just there for the sightseeing cruise, but we were at the front with our sommelier who was serving champagne, but then we could also hear the information about, about the sites that we were seeing as well. And so it basically cruised from the Eiffel Tower down past Notre Dame, and then it went around Notre Dame, which is on an island, and then back down the Fen. And we got to sample three different champagnes, and it was a little rainy, which was very nice because it had been kind of hot that day. So we just really enjoyed ourselves and it was just super relaxing. It was a great way to see the sights and it lasted an hour. So we were back to the right near the Eiffel Tower at 730, which then we felt like we had enough time before beach volleyball to go to a cafe and grab some dinner so we walked to a nearby cafe that we just found on Google and had a quick dinner there. We were definitely very American with how quickly we would eat sometimes. Like you mm-hmm. could tell they were like, you're leaving already? You've only been here an hour, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Um, but nevertheless, we needed to get to beach volleyball. So uh, then we walked from this cafe to the Eiffel Tower Stadium Uh, and we were through the security at Eiffel Tower Stadium around 9.30, and the beach volleyball matches started at 10. So late. (laughs) So late. So late. And it was definitely not because of the sand being hot, because we saw plenty of beach volleyball being played during the day. So I was like, okay, well, that theory was really silly. (laughs) Well, it's just so late. It's hard to imagine. Maybe they just have a lot to pack in. So. Yeah. And this was, you know, this, I mean, obviously this was the first day of Olympic events. And so this was early, early on in, you know, the different, like in the tournament for beach volleyball, but we got to see USA women play Canada. And then we also got to see um, a men's game. It was Qatar versus somebody else that I cannot remember. We were we were always cheering for like the smaller countries, which is why I remember that it was Qatar for sure. But that was really fun. And uh, it ended around like 11.30, 11.45. And we were all pretty tired by that point. So um, we actually ordered an Uber after beach volleyball ended. Uh, and took that back to our hotel and we were back in our room around 1230. But that was, it it was an amazing experience. The view with the Eiffel Tower in the background, Mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody saw that on TV. Like it was just incredible. And that particular night, the sunset, because it had rained. So it was like this pink and blue and orange sky so I was like is this real (laughs) like what I hope you got some good photos I did I'll send them to you it was it was pretty spectacular so and my brother my brother actually was there I had mentioned you know he got to go to any event that he wanted to that was what if they had space for press and they had space on this night for press and so he was able to join us too which was also really fun that is fun Yeah. That sounds like a really fun day. It was really fun. Really fun. 
Okay, that takes us to Sunday, July 28, where you are going to line up at a restaurant known for their steak and frites. Yes. And Courtney and Ed and Chelsea did that, but my brother was able to get one ticket for me to go to fencing. Uh, So he was able to get me in on like one of his media passes because that's who he works for USA Fencing. And so I actually left for fencing at nine from the hotel Mm -hmm. and just walked there. It was about a mile walk, not too bad. And it was really pleasant weather that morning. And so everybody else uh, slept in and they did go have steak and freaks. They were second in line and they loved it. But I spent the whole morning at the fencing venue, uh, got to see the, if that was the day that two of the USA women medaled, I didn't see the medal rounds because those were at night when we were at football, but I did see their early rounds. So that was really cool um, to see Team USA fencing. Is this one where the woman was seven months pregnant? uh, Yes, but she's not a U.S. athlete, but there was a seven month pregnant fencer from another Uh, country. Yeah. I know. (laughs) And she's like, let me let me tell you that after. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Pretty impressive that she did that for sure. So, yeah. Okay. So you got to go to an unexpected event that wasn't in your plans. Yeah. Okay. Then what did you do next? And then from there, I met back up with Chelsea and Ed and Courtney at the Musée de l'Orangerie. Mm-hmm. And that's where they have the Monet's water lilies. Mm-hmm. And it was true what I had read. You could be in and out of that museum seeing everything in about an hour. And that's exactly what we did. So we had a 2 p.m. reserved entrance and we really felt like we got to take in the water lilies mm-hmm. and see some of the other artwork that was there. Uh, and we were walking out of the museum shortly after three uh, and making our way to the train to head up to the Parc de Princes arena for football, soccer. And it was about a 40 minute train ride. So we got up to the arena. Uh, well, we got off the train actually around 345, four o'clock. But then it was about a 20 minute walk from the train to the actual arena entrance. So we were in the arena around 4.30 for a game, game time start of 5 o'clock, which was actually perfect. I had mentioned in the pre-trip, I think, that I we wanted to be there like an hour before. But what we found was that we really didn't need to. Security was actually really efficient. Uh, and so we were they were really getting us through quickly. So 30 minutes before was fine. And who was playing soccer? slash football this time yeah so this was a women's game and it was japan versus brazil and we were i so when you buy your tickets you buy a category you don't buy a specific seat and so we really didn't know where we would be sitting at all we ended up being two two rows off of the field which was wild but and it was it was a great view of the players. It was definitely a different view than like you know being able to see the whole field at mm-hmm. once. But it was really cool to kind of like see the players up close and like hear you, you could I mean hear them talking to each other too because we were that close. So that was really neat. And but the downside was that we were in full sun, so mm-hmm. it was really really hot. <laughs> so Chelsea and I left about 6 30 6 45 so we stayed for most of the game but we were like just real the heat was really getting to us and so we were like we'll see y'all later we gotta go um, and so can we talk about the heat because yeah. it was seasonable unseasonably hot yeah unseasonably warm like and and you know they don't similar to the pacific northwest they don't really have a lot of spaces with mm-hmm. air conditioning so even like going into restaurants and stuff, like mm-hmm. there's no guarantee that they're going to have air conditioning in there because they just don't usually meet it. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, it was, it was pretty warm. So yeah, that's a bummer. I, I mean, I, I feel for everybody who was, you know, trying to rest in their hotel and 
the temperature yeah. wasn't comfortable, but uh, particularly the athletes who were there too. Oh you my know, gosh. Yeah. I read compete. about that too. Yeah. That some of, I mean, that air conditioning was like an add on for the yes. athletes. Yeah. So fortunately we, all of us had agreed when we booked our hotel, we were like, air conditioning is a non-negotiable. So our hotel did have air conditioning, but some of the restaurants that we were like, oh, let's just go to a restaurant to escape the heat. And that was laughable because then we were sweating even more in, you know, in an enclosed space that was like a hot box. I was in Chicago once during a heat wave that was very much like this. And I live in Texas, so I know what it's like to live where it's hot, but they had the same thing. They did not have the infrastructure to keep up with the hundred degree temperatures. And so it was like, oh my gosh, we cannot escape the heat. The buses, the buses to get around town were the best bet because they were, they were. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. But not, not the restaurants, not the hotels. Nope. No, nope. they don't have it. Yeah. And yeah. And so whenever we get uh winter weather here, don't laugh at us and we won't laugh right. at the people that have the heat. We get it. Totally, you, don't have, totally. you don't have yeah. the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, okay. So was that the end of Sunday or did you do anything else? So we did a little bit more. So Ed and Courtney stayed for the rest of the game. They're also from Texas. I, I'm originally from Texas, but I feel like I have adapted to Pacific Northwest now. So the heat gets me way more than it used to. But they were like, this is nothing. So <laughs> they stayed for the whole game, which actually ended up being, it had like a really exciting ending where I think Japan came back and won it or something like in an amazing, or no, maybe it was... One of them won, obviously, but like it was an amazing like end where they were behind and came back to win in like the last five minutes of the game or something. Can so, you imagine how hot they must have been? Oh, they yeah. I mean, speaking of say, yeah, speaking yeah. Of heat, the players yeah. are running and running oh. and running and running. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I she and Courtney said that it just kept getting hotter. So those poor mm. players, I'm sure they were just like ready to be done. So such yeah. a bummer. I wonder if they trained for that just in case. Oh, I would hope. Yeah, for sure. I would, I would yeah. hope so too. Yeah. So, but Chelsea and I took the train back to the center city center. Uh, and that's the evening that she and I actually went to the main Olympic gift shop. And it also had a long queue. We waited in line for about 40 minutes for this particular gift shop, but we were really glad that we did because this one was massive. Um, and so we were able to get lots of souvenirs for friends and family. We spent um, probably about 45 minutes in there. Uh, and they had a lot of stuff that we hadn't seen at some of the like satellite gift shops. So we were glad that we had taken the time to do that. And then we made our way back to the to the area of where our hotel is, was and had dinner at a cafe right near our hotel. And it actually turned out that we had a view of where the Olympic torch was. So it was like this big balloon that like they would raise every night, kind of like the balloon in Disney Springs. Um, Yeah. And so they raised it every night lit and so we were there at, and they do, they did that at sunset. And so we were there at sunset. So we got to see that um, just sort of unexpectedly happen to be at the right place at the right time. So that was really cool to, to watch that. So got some pictures uh, and then made our way back to our hotel. And we started packing up that night, turned the Olympics on and watched it in French while we packed. And then we were in bed asleep around midnight. Okay. So the next day was Monday, July 29th. It was a combination of an Olympic thing and a Disney thing. Yes, indeed. And that's exactly what it was. So we, we were up around, we met around nine uh, down in the lobby, did our normal cafe stop for breakfast uh, and we had packed up and dropped our bags with bell services and then checked out and everything and then went to the cafe. Then we hopped on the Metro and went to the law defense arena. We got there around 10, 15 for an 11 o'clock start for swimming. And we, we got to see several heats. So this was 
really early on mm-hmm. in the swimming competition. So we got to see the, I think the 400, and we got to see the 1500 and a few others, but it also went by really fast. So we were done watching swimming at noon. So it was like a one hour session and then they funnel you out and then they bring in the next section of ticket holders for the next grouping of heats, which I was kind of surprised. I thought we would be there for at least two hours, Mm -hmm. but yeah, we were, we were out of there at noon uh, and then made our way on the Metro back to the area around our hotel now with sort of a, an after an unexpected afternoon. So we did a little bit of shopping, went in and out of some of the like, you know, really signature luxury shops just to kind of window shop and see what they had. And then we went to a cafe in that same neighborhood where we, we did act very Parisian on this day because we sat at the cafe for like two and a half hours. So because you, because you could. Because we could, yep. Ordered a bottle of wine, had a delicious lunch. And this was actually my favorite meal of our time in Paris. Like the food was delicious, but I also just loved getting to just sit, you know, and and take in the the ambiance. So it was so, really lovely. You mentioned that your swimming tickets were for one hour. So uh, maybe silly question, but if someone was very into swimming, are there tickets that allow you to stay? Like for a long time, they, fun- I mean, maybe, I mean, they funneled us out. It was like, okay, your session has ended. Have a good day. So I don't know if you would have to leave and then get back in the queue and scan in with your next ticket. But it, I mean, they were like sweeping the rows and hmm. moving everybody out. So that's a really good question. I don't know. It just feels like if that's your focus, you should be able to have like a, a day pass. Totally. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And like at fencing, I, you know, I could enter at 9am and I could have stayed all the way up until the medal round. That was a separate ticketed event. But once you left the fencing venue, you couldn't go back in. So like if you were there for the day, you were there for the day and Hmm. there's no in and out privilege. Hmm. So That's a bummer. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Interesting how it all works. Yeah, Sounds like it just sure. var- varies by event. Yeah, I think it must. So so after your leisurely time in the cafe, did you go back to your hotel to get your bags? We did. Yep. And from there, we um, got an Uber to the train station. Uh, we just felt like that was going to be easier with all of our bags and all of our things instead of changing from the metro to the train. So we took an Uber to the train station and hopped on. Uh, this was around rush hour, which was maybe not the best decision because we were with all of the commuters mm-hmm. with all of our bags. But nevertheless, we made the best of it. And once we got further and further away from the city, obviously the train was less and less crowded. But we arrived to Disneyland Paris around 5.30, 5.45 and you actually like you get off the train and you go through security to get into the Disneyland area. And so because we were walking through the their like downtown Disney area, we you go right through security. So we had all of our suitcases and everything went through that. And then it's it's a little like a 10 minute walk to the our hotel from the security area. And it, this was also at like what felt like the hottest part of the day. So it felt like a very far walk, even though it was only 10 minutes because we were just tired and hot Mm -hmm. and had all of our suitcases, but we made it to our hotel. And by this point we had canceled and rescheduled for another day, our dinner at Waltz, because we were like, we just need a break. (laughs) So got to the room, checked in, got settled. And um, we all just relaxed, you know, in our separate rooms for a little bit. Chelsea and I wanted to go check out the pool. So we changed into our swimsuits and headed down to the pool for just like a half an hour, 45 minutes. We really wanted to sit in the hot tub, which ended up being a cold tub. (laughs) So 
and was like, well, this isn't really what we had in mind, but that's okay. Um, they, it was they, said, they said, we've heard cold plunges are popular, so let's make yeah. our hot tub cold. Yeah, exactly. We both got in there like, well, this is unexpected, <laughs> but like tons of people were sitting in it. So when you walk up, you're like, oh, the hot tub must be really pleasant. And I mean, it was a hot day. So, I mean, it, w- it was refreshing. So, <laughs> and then we um, went back to our room, changed really quick, and then decided to uh, take advantage of the the late park hours. Um, so we went into the park and grabbed our glass of champagne from the little champagne cart and just walked around and took in the ambiance. We did the the dragon that's under the castle. We did that little walk through and saw that. And then we walked over to Phantom Manor and rode Phantom Manor. And I didn't know this at the time, but Courtney hadn't finished her champagne and she carried it right on the ride. No comments. And so she what? was like, I was sipping champagne while on Phantom Manor. But yeah. can we also talk about the availability of alcohol? Yeah. Also that, which was wild. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and she did that again on Pirates later on, like on another day. And so I was just like, well, they just are very, you know, free with the rules here, I guess. That is hilarious because I definitely would have been chugging in, you know, finding a trash can and everything. Totally, totally. Yeah, we were shocked. And she even, like when she got off the ride, she was like still holding it. And she was like, (laughs) oh, I what just happened? Like it was so shocking that she didn't even realize it till the ride was over. She accidentally discovered a different uh, set of rules. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but Phantom Manor was really cool. I love the Haunted Mansion. So it Mm -hmm. was neat to kind of see the differences. It really focuses more so, I feel like, on the the bride and like her story of all of her husbands. Like even in the stretching room, the portraits are all of her with the husband or husbands, maybe. And so that was, that was different. And there were a lot more skeletons. So not as many like happy, funny ghosts and a little, a little more creepy. Darker. Um, yeah. A little darker, but still really cool. Uh, and it, and like I said, just neat to kind of compare the two. So, or the three, I, I guess. Yeah. I do think it's interesting. Yeah. Um, ha- but I haven't been to this park yet. So maybe someday. I'll just take your word for how uh, it compares to the uh, domestic parks. Yeah. Is that the, is that the end of your park time or did you do anything else? That was pretty much the end of the park time. We made our way back to the hotel and stopped in the Disney village area at a little brasserie and had a late dinner. By this point, I think it was like nine o'clock, but we were all pretty hungry at this point. And so just had a a late dinner and then we were back to our rooms and in bed around 1130. Okay. Pretty late considering you were going to have some (laughs) early entry days. Uh, The next day was Tuesday, July 30th with the 830 early entry and you had plans to rip drop Walt Disney Studios. Yep. And that is what we did. We stopped at Starbucks on the way to the, uh, on our walk to the park and we left our hotel at like 7.50. We were at Starbucks shortly before 8. And then we were at the gate for um, to walk into Disney Studios at like 8.15, 8.20. So if that tells you, like just everything is so super close together, which was really nice. And it was really easy into the park. We had gone through security right outside of our hotel. Mm -hmm. So as we were walking into the Disney Village area, so that had already been taken care of. And then our room key was our park ticket. So we just scanned that in at the actual entrance to the park. And then from there, we just started like making our way, kind of getting the lay of the land a little bit, making our way around to 
some of the different rides, some things weren't open for um, the early entry time. So we had about an hour where um, there were just a few things open and we also couldn't use our premier access pass yet um, mm-hmm. when we didn't really need to. I mean, it was not crowded. So we started off with Tower of Terror, which is an identical story to the one in Florida, but there's no like, like the, not the pre-show, but like, you know how you like go on a track? Mm-hmm. There's none of that. Like there's no forward movement. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's no forward movement. So you get in the elevator and the little girl is there and she is extra creepy. (laughs) And so she's like talking to you in French uh, and like in this like creepy voice sort of reminded me of the the little girls from The Shining. Mm -hmm. And so she's like talking to you and doing like the hand motions forward, you know, to join her or whatever. And then the doors like close again. And then you go up and down and up and down multiple times. So it was a little shocking at first because we were like, oh, oh, this is it. This is how this ride goes. (laughs) So, But I love Tower of Terror and I loved this. I thought it was, I thought it was really fun. It was just so different but then also not different, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. And then from there, we went over to Web Slingers, which I haven't been to Disneyland since 2018. So I haven't ridden Web Slingers before and I loved it. It was so fun and just cute. Like, and the technology was really cool. So we enjoyed that. And then we crisscrossed back over to the other side of the park. And by this time, the park had opened for everyone. And so Courtney rode Crush's coaster. And when she came off of it, she was like, yeah, you definitely can't do that. So (laughs) I was glad that we sat that one out because I feel like both Chelsea and I would have been like, no, thank you. That like, I think it might've ruined the rest of our day. Because she said she even felt a little whooshy after it. She she said it reminded her of Guardians of the Galaxy, but a little less smooth because it's also a little bit older. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then we did the Toy Story parachutes. So they literally just go up and down, but it was cool views of the park. And this did not have premier access. So it was just a regular standby queue. We waited in this line for 30 minutes. And that was the longest line that we waited in the whole time we were there was 30 minutes. 30 30 minutes for the parachute. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) And I think probably because it didn't have the premier access. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that was that was the longest line. And I don't even know if we would have needed premier access. Like I go back and forth because there were some rides like Ratatouille that and Pirates that we would have waited maybe 30 or 45 minutes for. So for those particular rides, it was nice to not have to wait, but largely most of the queues, like the standby queues were 10, 15 minutes. So I... I feel like I, and I was surprised because I know you and I talked about in the pre-trip, I was like, well, it's the Olympics. Disneyland Paris is probably going to be busy. And it really wasn't. So yeah, that was going to be my next question is if you had a feel for the crowds. Yeah. And I mean, I don't have anything to compare it to, but it, other than, you know, obviously Disneyland and Disney World here, and it felt way less busy than Disneyland or Disney World here. So, yeah, like, the wait times, I guess, would be your best indicator. Yeah, yeah, totally. Before your trip, were you ever checking wait times just to see what it was like? You know, I had, and I it, I was seeing, especially after a couple of the trip reports where people had been, and I was seeing the same thing then too, like the 5, 10, 15 minutes. So I I was surprised that it was the same as what I had Mm -hmm. been, you know, what had been reported before. So definitely with all the tourists, I would have thought, yep, 
They'll be yeah. going to Disneyland. Maybe, maybe we're projecting because we know that's what we would do. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so when in Paris, you have to go to Disneyland. Paris. Exactly. Yeah. So after the parachutes, we went back to ride Ratatouille and the area where Ratatouille and Shea Remy is, I was like, are we in Epcot? Are, mm-hmm. Like in the France pavilion of Epcot? Like it was almost identical. It felt very Epcot-ish back there. Except um, except you're in like a French area in France. Right, exactly. <laughs> Which is exactly. super funny. Yeah, yeah. But it was really cute back there and uh, loved riding Ratatouille. It's identical, except you don't wear 3D glasses. So really? it's not 3D. Yeah. I was really surprised. I didn't so, know that. Yeah. But oh. it was great. And I love that ride. So that was fun. And then we rode Cars Road Trip, which is basically they've taken the Backlot Studio Tour and turned it into Cars Road Trip. It's like complete with the oil tanker and the fire and the water and all of that. So wow. We- and the the trams are the same. Do you remember like the red tram mm-hmm. with like the yeah? So the newer newer park fans are not going to remember this, but no, that, yeah. they took they took that out of Hollywood Studios for uh, Galaxy's Edge. Yeah, yeah. So we walked back there and we saw the trams. And both Courtney and I have been going to Disney World our whole lives, and we turned to each other. We're like, this. This has got to be Backlot Studio Tour. And then we get on the cars and we were, and then we sort of second guessed ourselves. And then we turn a corner and we see the oil tanker and we were like, oh yeah. And so it was just fun because Chelsea had never been on that ride because the first time she went to Disney World was with me like 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And so we like didn't tell her what to expect. And then she, and she was like, at first, like when we got off, she said, I was going to be really mad at y'all because I was like, what a boring ride. But then that happened and she was like, okay, this is actually pretty cute and cool. So that's funny. I yeah. would expect to see that attraction again. But. No, I know. Yeah. So that was really fun. And then we went to the Together musical and that was fantastic. I loved it so much. It was a bunch of different Pixar characters and it was just so well done characters that you don't see you know or that like that I don't typically see in the parks here were on stage and it was it just had a really cute message and I loved it so much so I'm like anybody who's going to Disneyland Paris they have to see this musical it, we we all loved it it was great so And that was about 30 minutes or so, um, that musical length. And then by that time, it was time for our lunch reservation at Pim's Tough Kitchen, which was a buffet. And it looked like I had looked at the Pim's menu for Disneyland to just see. And it looked like it was similar food. Like, you know, there's blue mayonnaise. And then there's like the giant pretzel that you Mm -hmm. get at your table when you sit down. So it looked like it was similar, a similar menu, but it was just a buffet. So you could choose whatever you wanted. And we loved, we loved it. It was great. It was, I mean, American food, definitely no French (laughs) flair, but it was exactly what we needed, air conditioned and just a nice opportunity to, to sit down for a little bit. So we enjoyed that lunch. How how were the uh, Disneyland Paris facilities keeping up with the heat? Was it better than what you had experienced in the city? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Anytime we went into a ride or into a restaurant, it was nice and cool in there. It wasn't the like hit you in your face cold like it is in Florida mm-hmm. for some of, you know, like when you walk into some of the places and you're just like suddenly freezing it wasn't like that, but it was noticeably cooler and pleasant inside all the rides and stuff. So good. Yeah. And then what did you do after lunch at Pims? So then we we were ready for an afternoon break. So we stopped um, on our way back to the hotel at World of Disney, did a little bit of shopping, and then got back to our rooms and just rested 
I think I, our break was probably about two and a half hours or so. So around uh, five o'clock, we were ready to head back into the parks. And so we we made our way. This time we were going to go into Disneyland Park. So we made our way back through security, through the gates. And one of the cool things that I hadn't seen or or really expected was that they have these like covered breezeways down either side of Main Street. So instead of walking straight down Main Street in the direct sun, they have these arcade walkthroughs Mm -hmm. on either side. Um, And so we did one of those arcade walkthroughs. And I'm assuming, you know, because like it snows and obviously the extreme heat. And so that was really cool. And they had like lots of vintage posters in there. Um, It was also a back entrance to all of the stores on that particular side of Main Street. Um, And so we just made our way down Main Street through the arcade walkthrough. Um, And then when we popped out on the other end, we just happened upon a parade by chance. And so, and it was, it was really more of a cavalcade, but that was cool. There were some princesses and the classic characters. And then we made our way to Pirates and rode Pirates, which is where both Chelsea and Courtney were like, We want to eat at Captain Jack's, which is the ride that over or the restaurant that overlooks pirates. And so I I was like in planner mode, got my phone out and found us a a reservation for the next day um, to go to pirate or to go to Captain Jack's. Um, But this was also the night that we had rescheduled our dinner at Waltz. So I was able to grab a different reservation, which I think also speaks to how not crowded it was that I was able to very easily move our dining reservations around. So dinner at Waltz, which we all really enjoyed. Each of the rooms is themed after a different land within Disneyland. So like there's a frontier land room, a tomorrow land room, an adventure land room. And we were in the adventure land room and it was very like Arabian themed So lots of like, you know, gold and sequins and like tapestries and things. So that was really cool. And then I walked through and saw all the other rooms. There was also like the fantasy land room had all this like really cool woodwork that looked like the inside of a castle. And then the menu was all of Walt's favorite dishes. And so I had chili which was a surprising choice because it was so hot, but I, it was like the thing that I had heard you have to have. So I was like, I'm just going to do it. And so it was cool that they served it in like a ceramic can, like it looked like a can, but it was a, cer- a piece of ceramic. So it looked like a can of chili. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they also had like deconstructed chili on a plate on the side and it was just a really cool presentation of the the dish. And both I can't remember what Chelsea and Courtney had, but they both loved their food as well. And we were in there for probably an hour and a half. And so then by that point, it we had time to ride like one more ride before the nighttime show. And at this point, Ed had made his way back into the park. He had spent the day back in Paris. There were a couple museums that he had wanted to go to. So he took the train back into the city and spent his day there. And by this point, he was back. So he met us and we made our way over to Fantasyland and Discoveryland is what they call Tomorrowland. And so... We, Chelsea and I rode Small World and Ed and Courtney rode Hyperspace Mountain, which again, Courtney was like, nope, you, you wouldn't like it. So <laughs> she was my, she was my test run for all the big rides. The, the canary um, in the coal mine. Yeah, exactly. And she, but she said they loved it. It's Star Wars themed. And so they really enjoyed it. And so then we met back up with them to find 
our reserved seating area for the nighttime entertainment. And that different than Magic Kingdom, which I feel like is pretty intuitive and there's like, and maybe it's because I've been there a lot, so I haven't figured out, but I think just not knowing all these like little side paths for how to get places, we got pretty lost trying to find our entrance area to get to the reserved seating. And so we were getting nervous because they said they stopped letting you in to the reserved seating 30 minutes before the show starts. We made it like at the 31st minute. So we were right there and fortunately got into the area and it was totally worth the payment. I think it was like 20 euros per person. So it wasn't really even that expensive of an add-on, all things considered. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were like right in front of the castle, center view with, and a little bit elevated. So anybody that was in front of us, even if they had had kids on their shoulders, which nobody did in Paris, which was also nice and respectful. But even if they had, I don't think that it would have blocked our view. Um, So the first thing was the drone show, which was amazing. And it was like the nighttime electrical sky parade is, Mm -hmm. is basically what it was with the drones. And it was so cool and just so nostalgic for the Main Street electrical parade you know, they had like the dragon and like the the bugs and all of that, which was really cool. And then, and so that was about like 20 minutes or so. And then it was the castle projections with fireworks. So the main nighttime show. So the drone show was considered the pre-show. And that was equally as wonderful. A lot of the, the, commentary in French, which was to be expected. So, but even though we didn't understand a lot of what they were saying, I mean, we still got the gist and I still teared up. So <laughs> I loved it. It was it was really, really wonderful. Did you feel like your reserve viewing was good for both shows, the drone show and the Illum- Illuminations? Yeah. I think it's called, right? Yes, you're right. Yep. Illuminations. You know, I think if we had been further back, the castle may not have blocked some of the drone shapes that were being made, but because they like moved through the sky, you got to see them on one side of the castle or the other. Whereas if you were further back, it probably would have like arced over the castle. So we were close in that regard. So maybe further back for that would have been better but we still felt like we got to see it when it was on either side of the castle. So it, we still felt like it was a good place to be. Okay. Yeah. And not, and for not very much money. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't a dessert party or anything. So it made sense that it wasn't a super expensive add-on. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Was that the end of the day then? That was. So then we made our way back to our hotel. It was really nice to just walk back to the hotel after the nighttime show and the mad rush of everybody leaving. And we were back to our rooms and in bed by midnight. Yeah. I know the drone show and the fireworks are pretty late, right? Yeah. Let's see. I think nine nine thirty is when we needed to be in the seating area. Then 10 o'clock was drones and 1030 was illuminations, if I'm mm-hmm. remembering correctly. So yeah, it was it was pretty late. Yep. So makes sense why you got back around midnight or yeah. so. The yep. next day was Wednesday, July 31st. Again, parks opening at 830. Again, rope drop. But this time, Disneyland was your plan. Yep. And that's what we did. Stop at Starbucks again on our walk to Disneyland and we left it left the room at the same time shortly before eight at Starbucks when they opened at eight and then in line for Disneyland at like 820. So very quick um and quick to get in. It was a little more crowded getting into Disneyland than it was to Disney Studios, but not like noticeably so like where we were waiting much longer we maybe waited like 
five minutes instead of just a straight walkthrough. So first thing we did was walk, actually like got to walk up in the castle. And so we did that. And then you can like go out onto a little balcony off the back of the castle and overlook fantasy land. And then they also have these really beautiful tapestries that tell the story of Sleeping Beauty. So it was neat to see that in there. And then from there, we did, it was a walk-on for Peter Pan. Uh, We weren't using our Premier Access Pass yet because we couldn't, but we also wouldn't have needed to. Five-minute wait for Peter Pan, which was shocking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then we made our way over to the Discovery Land area and rode Buzz, which was both Peter Pan and Buzz were identical to Magic Kingdom. And then we rode Star Tours. And I actually rode Star Tours. I was like, that's one where I know I can just close my eyes and be Mm -hmm. fine. But I hadn't ridden Star Tours in Magic Kingdom in a long time. So this, it was 3D. I didn't remember it being 3D, but. And Courtney couldn't remember either if it had been 3D, but we we wore 3D glasses for this one. So yes, Star Tours at Hollywood Studios is 3D. Oh, it is. Okay. Awesome. Has it always been 3D? As far as I can remember. Okay. Okay. Uh, I just hadn't ridden it in so long and I I did fine. It was okay. I didn't even have to close my eyes at all. I'm surprised because that one gets a lot of people. Yeah, I know. I was, I was like, I'm just going to risk it. Um, Chelsea didn't risk it, but I risked it and it was, I did okay. So that was, that was great. Um, and then from there, we crisscrossed back over to the other side of the park and rode Big Thunder, which was so cool. So it is like the ride itself is on an island. So you queue on the other side of the island or on the, like on the main part of the park. And then you board the train and then it goes underwater um, and then pops up on the island and that, you know, you do the whole ride and then you go back underwater back to the the main queue area. Um, so that was really cool. Pretty similar to big thunder back here, but just that added piece of going underwater was a neat, you know, thing that made it unique. Uh, and then we did, uh, we rode Pinocchio and Snow White, which also, as as far as I can remember, it's been a long time since I'd ridden either of those, but seemed pretty similar other than being in French. And those were walk-ons as well. And then at this point it was noon and time for us to make our way to captain jack's for lunch and very similar feel to like blue bayou in terms of you know seeing the the pirates boats drive by and it was caribbean food the food was okay It, it you know it nourished us for lunch. It was okay. Um, it, it nourished us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but we were definitely there for the ambiance. And and that, I mean, it gave us everything we wanted. We were like some of, so actually lunch must have been at 11 because we were some of the first people to be seated. And I think they opened at 11. And so we got to sit right on the water and see all the boats go by. So that was really cool. Um, And then, of course, we had to ride pirates afterwards. Um, So we did that. And then we made our way over to ride Indiana Jones, um, which is a roller coaster. And I, as we're walking up, I see that it has like the -the over-the-shoulder restraints. And so I was like this goes upside down. Mm. <laughs> and, and then, you know, the, the poor cast member, I, I don't know if she spoke much English at all. And so I don't know if she necessarily understood what I was asking, but I was like, does this go upside down? And she was like, 
she said no at first. And then she goes, oh, just a little loop, just a little loop. And I said, like, I'm out. <laughs> but Chelsea wrote it. And I think because she didn't have enough time to like psych herself out, she came off and she was like, that was awesome. So she loved it. Of course, Courtney wrote it, loved it. And Chelsea loves Indiana Jones, the Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland. And so I was glad that she risked it and wrote it and loved it. So it was good. Glad that worked out. (laughs) Yeah. And then from there, we decided to not go back to the hotel to take a break, but we just walked um, out of the park and went to Starbucks and just sat in the air conditioning, got some drinks and just relaxed for, we probably sat in there for about an hour and it was just a nice reset. We, we had tickets for the Mickey and the Magician show at 4.15 and didn't like if we had walked all the way back to the hotel, we probably would have only been able to be in our rooms for like 30 minutes. And so we just felt like that wasn't going to be enough time to like fully relax. So it was nicer to just not rush and just go to Starbucks. So we did that and then made our way into Disneyland Studios to go to the Mickey and the Magician show, which was also wonderful. I really loved this one too. And uh, I I liked Together better, but this one was just also just lovely. So I, I don't have a bad thing to say about it. I just liked the other one better. So mm-hmm. I was glad we got to see both. And then we, for nostalgia's sake, we um, went back and rode Cars Road Trip again, and then uh, rode Ratatouille again, and then it was time for our dinner reservation at Chez Remy. And we, I love Ratatouille, so I was really, really excited about this dinner. And when you walk in, the cast member, like as she's taking you back to your table, she's like, So here at Shea Remy, we are all the same size as rats. So as you walk into the restaurant, you will notice that you become the same size as a rat and everything gets bigger. And so even like, and she was like pointing things out so we wouldn't miss it. But like even the tile on the floor went from being human size to being giant as if you were a rat. And So, I mean, it's Disney, right? Like the attention to detail was just so cool. And this was a really enjoyable meal. I mean, mostly for the ambiance, the food was good, but definitely the ambiance was worth it tenfold. So we loved this dinner. Good. It sounds, one of the criticisms people have of Disneyland Paris is often the food. And yeah, a lot of your food experiences seem like they've been pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I think we had like, you know, we had set our expectations pretty low because I had also heard that. And so I had picked places that I had read about were pretty good. And I, I had not, you know, in our, in the pre-trip planning had not picked Captain Jack's because I hadn't read about it and ended up being kind of true. But yeah, Shea Remy and Walt's, Definitely, like what I had read is, you know, pretty good food. And I would say pretty good food. But yeah, we didn't eat at any of the quick service spots. So I can't really speak to any of those. But yeah, I mean, I think because we had sort of gone into it with lower expectations, we weren't really expecting much. And so we were pleased with our meals. So And just while we're talking about Disneyland Paris thoughts in general, uh, how did you feel about your hotel? Really cool. Very, very American. I mean, it's Hotel New York. So, you know, and it was all like the Marvel characters, which was neat. They had Marvel statues sort of throughout. And it, I mean, it felt like you were in a Marvel movie. So it was like the most different from what I could tell, just looking online from the other hotels, like in Walt Disney World, which is why I picked it, because they have one called the Sequoia, 
which looks very similar to Wilderness Lodge. And then they have another one that looks very similar to like the Beach and Yacht Club. And so I just wanted to do something a little bit different. And it was very different than any other Disney property I'd ever stayed at. So that was that was really neat. I wish that we had had time to walk to some of the other Disney properties, but you know, ne- there's never enough time. So um, were you so glad that you stayed that. in a Disney hotel as opposed to, you know, somewhere else nearby? Yeah, especially for ease of just like literally being able to walk out of our hotel straight through security and into, you know, the the Disney Village area because we never waited in line for security. I mean, it was always just a straight walkthrough. And I don't know, like the main gates, I ne- I never had to walk past those. So I don't know what that security line looked like for those folks. But yeah, definitely. For the extra hour in the morning and mm-hmm. the ease, it was totally worth it in our opinion. And then you've, you've talked about your Premier Access Pass a little bit where you said, you know, a couple of times it did save you a lot. Uh, in retrospect, would you have gotten it? Probably not. I think we would have like now, now that we've been, and I could like build a touring plan knowing that like, okay, we should go back and ride Ratatouille first thing because it will have a 45 minute wait, you know, later on in the day. I don't think that you need it. Because also 45 minutes for Ratatouille is unheard of in Epcot, you know, like that's a short wait. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so I think that, yeah, I I would say probably we wouldn't buy it again and, and we would be okay waiting, you know, 10 to 15 minutes for most of the rides. Okay. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. I was just trying to get some of those things out of the way before we move on to the next segment of your trip, which is coming up the next day on Thursday, August 1st. Yeah. So after, after dinner, we, it was, it was an early night. We were back in our rooms by 9 PM packing and getting ready. And so that next morning we met Ed and Courtney in the lobby at six 30 to say bye. They were hopping on the Disney transportation. They had booked the Disney bus to take them to the airport And so they were getting on that and we were walking back through the Disney village to catch the train back into the city. And I kid you not, we like the dark, the storm clouds were some of the darkest I feel like I've ever seen. We walk into the train station, like into the covered area and it just dumps rain like we missed it by 60 seconds so we were feeling pretty lucky that that we had made it without getting totally soaked so we bought our train tickets got on the um, train back into the city it was a 50 minute train ride to the Gare du Nord station and so we were at the station by eight o'clock So that was plenty of time for us to grab some breakfast from just like a little grab and go stand there in the train station. And then we went through customs and did the whole security thing to be queued up for our Eurostar train, which departed for London at 9.12 a.m. And we were in like a, um, like one step up from coach, we were in those seats. So we had seats that faced each other with a table between us and it was just the two of us. So that was nice to just kind of have like our, our own space. And then it also came with like a breakfast snack. Uh, so just enjoyed that train ride. We both slept a little bit and then we arrived to London at 10.30 with the time change because it's an hour earlier in London. And then made our way to the tube to make our way to our hotel. And by this point, Chelsea was starting to feel a little bit sick. And I, w- I think I was just feeling exhausted 
because it had been go, go, go for now a, a week, essentially. And so we had planned to like go and have lunch somewhere, but our room was ready. And so we were like, we're taking a nap. <laughs> so that's what we did. And so we were in the room by about noon and took a nap for about an hour and a half and then decided to just grab some lunch from the hotel, which was actually a really lovely little restaurant in the hotel. It overlooked the the Thames and we could see the Houses of Parliament and we could see like a lot of a lot of the sites just from the restaurant. So it ended up being really lovely. It wasn't crowded. So had a great lunch there, late lunch, and then made our way to the Frameless Museum, which is the one that I had found through an Instagram ad. Mm -hmm. We could enter anytime before 4 p.m. We got there at 3 and then we could stay as long as we wanted. We really only had about an hour and a half. And that was that was plenty of time. And it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we had been to some pretty spectacular museums in Paris. And so, you know, we and we had like seen some of this artwork, like the real artwork. The real. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, it was kitschy and it was it was cool to be it was air conditioned so you know it was it was fine i wouldn't do it again and i don't know that i would recommend it to anybody unless they were like just really keen on seeing one of the paintings come to life in particular but so we were there for about an hour and a half cuz we we did want to see all the rooms and like just so each room was like a different type of like style or time period of painting and uh, or and or featured a different art like a singular artist and so you would go in and it would be like on the floor ceiling walls and the paintings would come to life and it was like a 30 minute show where like multiple they would cycle through multiple paintings and so to like see all of the paintings come to life in a particular room you would sit in there for a half an hour and then you would go to another room and do the same thing. And so we sat in a couple of rooms for like maybe 10, 15 minutes to see part of it. And then some of the rooms, we just were in and out because they were really crowded. So it was, it was fine. <laughs> and then it was time to make our way to our London food tour. So we took the tube to... Soho and met at met the group at a pub and this was a group of there were five of us so another couple and then a man who was there by himself the couple ended up being from the Seattle area which was super random <laughs> and then the man ended up being from Lubbock Texas which is where I went to college so I was just like this is so weird um, cue, so. cue the It's a Small World song. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it was just, you know, fun to like compare notes about it's, the different places. We did yeah. a, when we did the Alaskan cruise last year, we had a excursion to go whale watching and the two guides and every single person on the group is from Dallas, Fort Worth. And we what? were in Alaska. Oh and I was like, are we, am I being pranked? How is yeah. everybody here from the same city? It was really weird. Yeah, that is wild. Yeah. Um, so, this yeah. food tour that you booked is the same company that you book for the Paris food tour? Correct. Yep. Okay. So Eating Eating Europe, and it was called Eating London. And this one was called the Twilight Soho Food Tour. And so this particular one came with a cocktail at every stop. And I I was sure they were going to be like, little samples of cocktails. No, they were full-size cocktails. So like after the second stop, both Chelsea and I were like, okay, we're we're good. Like we started like sharing cocktails because we were mm -hmm. like, we cannot be sloshed in a city that we're unfamiliar with. So the first stop was Mexican food, which was 
unique. And they said, you know, obviously London isn't known for their Mexican food, but if you're going to have Mexican food in London, there's two places you should go. And this is one of them. And it was. So we had a taco and a margarita there. And then we went to an Indian restaurant and they had like several dishes that we could try. And then a gimlet cocktail, which was also amazing. And the food was incredible. And then from there, we had bao buns just from like a street vendor. And then we went to a tapas restaurant where you could choose anything from their menu because it was like a tapas bar. Mm -hmm. And so you just went up and you could pick whatever you wanted. And so everybody got to, or you could pick three items. And so everybody got to pick whatever they wanted, three things. And then from there, we went to a speakeasy for dessert. Uh, And so that was an interesting experience, just like to hear the history of the speakeasy across the street from this particular speakeasy is a record studio where the Beatles first recorded. So that was cool. So this one also incorporated like a little bit of history in, in the walking tour as well. And it was slated to go until 845, but I don't know if it was just because we were a smaller group or what, but we were done by eight, um, which was fine because both Chelsea and I were exhausted. So we were like, we are, we are fine that this is done early. So we made our way back to the um, hotel. We took an Uber actually back um, and we were um, in the room and in bed by like 930. So that's fantastic. Eating tour sounded really great though. Like a lot of stops. Yes. A lot of stops, a lot of different types of food. And we we were kind of like, so we we went through like Chinatown and that's where we got the bao buns. And I I really, I did. I loved that it was like food from all over the world mm-hmm. and which, you know, she talked, our tour guide was fantastic, born and raised in London. So she knew, every, you know, everything really. And uh, so she was talking about, you know, how it really is just a melting pot there and all these different cuisines and all these different like rising chefs, Mm -hmm. rising star chefs. And she, our tour guide actually is moving to Scotland to set up their eating Scotland tours. So it was just cool to hear her story as well. And like how she got involved in this company and everything. So it was really fun. Love that. seems like they do a good job based on your experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I would highly recommend that company and they have tours all over Europe and now Scotland too. So yes. uh, Yeah. Highly recommend. So that takes us to the next day, which was Friday, August 2nd. And you had a tour booked uh, in the morning to go to through, it was booked through golden tours. You said, yep. Correct. To go to Windsor. And we, we, it was basically like an open, an open ticket. So you could, uh, other than you had a timed entry that we got sent like the week before the tour. So like the Friday before I got an email and it was like, your timed entry at Windsor is for noon. So I just, I knew that that's when we would need to be there. Um, And so I just timed it out from there as to when we needed to catch the train and our train ticket was included, but it didn't have a timestamp on it. So it was, uh, and it was the, the fast train to Windsor. So it was just a 30 minute train ride from the Paddington station. So we made our way on the tube to the Paddington station and then um, we hopped on the train to Windsor, got there around like 1045. And so we had a little bit of time to kill. So we just walked through the shops in Windsor, you know, all the, all the tourist shops with all the UK swag and just kind of took took in the ambiance and then we queued up to walk into the castle at like 11 45 is when they started letting the noon tickets in and we toured the castle for about an hour and a half and i had previously made us a lunch reservation at uh the royal windsor pub but i bumped that to 1 30 to allow us more time and so we it, we enjoyed it. It was super crowded. And because it's an old castle, it was super hot. Mm-hmm. 
So <laughs> no air conditioning and very, very crowded. So we, I had been before and this was my least favorite tour of Windsor. Like I'd been actually twice before to Windsor and this was my least favorite because of how crowded and hot it was, which was a bummer because I was really excited for Chelsea to see it. And she really loves that kind of history stuff, but it, we saw it. It was cool. Uh, and then we were ready to have lunch <laughs> and get out of the crowd. So we walked to the Royal Windsor pub, which actually ended up being a little bit off the beaten path. So it felt like it wasn't as touristy because it wasn't like on the main drag right there by the castle. And so when we walked in, we didn't even need our reservation because it was pretty empty and it seemed like it was mostly locals, which was great. Like that's totally the kind of experience that I'm looking for. So also, I, I was just thinking of that about your plans. It does feel like, you know, when in, you know, when in Paris, see the Eiffel Tower, but also let's go off the beaten path. I feel like you're kind of combining those. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely like to do that, especially with restaurants, I think, because I mean, obviously you're going to get the better food if you're not at the tourist trap, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was a great lunch. We sat out on their little patio, which was shaded and had a nice breeze and had a great lunch. And then we walked back to the train and got back to our hotel. And we were still both feeling just a little, a little off. Chelsea was getting sicker and I was just. And so we just rested at the hotel, took naps. And I always have this feeling of guilt when I'm like in a place where I'm mm -hmm. like, I should be out doing stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, no, it's okay to nap on vacation. Like this is vacation. So I was trying to like rid myself of that guilt and just allow my body to rest. And we did, we did do that, even though I felt the guilt. So I do, I do think that's a special layer of difficulty when you're sick. I mean, people plan yeah. like Disney World trips for a long time. It's a lot of money. And then you get there and you're like, but I'm sick. I have to stay in bed. Really out there is all this stuff happening. Totally, totally. It's so yeah. it's such, so hard. It's like a, a mental part that makes the physical part more difficult. Yep. Yep, absolutely. <sighs> Which yeah. is a bummer, but okay, yeah. we're we're, yeah. we're going through it. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, we so we took naps and then I had made us dinner reservations at this restaurant called Churchill Arms, which is a it's I I guess I've seen it like from some London influencers that I follow. It's a pub that is like just covered in flowers. So it just looks really beautiful and it was really beautiful on the outside. And then in the back of the pub, they have a Thai restaurant and we both really love Thai food. So we wanted to try it and it was delicious. We really enjoyed our dinner there and we had gotten there a little early. So we had drinks in the front part of the restaurant, like in the pub and then you go back into this like little garden space and it's a completely separate operation of this little tiny Thai restaurant. So like the the dichotomy of the two was kind of mm -hmm. cool as well. So great dinner there. And then we made our way back to our hotel and we were in bed by, I think like 10 o'clock. So mm -hmm. not, a, not a super late night, all things considered from other nights. <laughs> So. You need you need your rest. Yep. Gotta, gotta go to bed. The next day was Saturday, August 3rd, and you had some things scheduled and also some loose plans to do some yep. sizing. Yeah. So we woke up and we were both actually feeling better, I think, because we had like really slowed down the day before and and even the Thursday. And so we were feeling better, made our way to the borough market which is just a lot of different like food vendors, farmers. And so we, and we had been like following them on Instagram to see like, what do we need to have? And so we knew we wanted to have these chocolate covered strawberries that they have, which sounds so simple, but they were amazing. So it's like, they fill a cup halfway with strawberries and they do like a chocolate sauce, 
more strawberries, more chocolate sauce. So it's not like a traditional hard chocolate covered strawberry, but they were delicious. The chocolate was amazing. And then we had fresh pressed juice. And then, you know, because why not on vacation? We had mac and cheese for breakfast. So they were um, selling it. What are you supposed to do? Exactly. Yeah. So that, that was our breakfast that morning. Those three things we shared and just enjoyed walking around and like seeing all the different food vendors and being like, okay, well, if we were here for a week, we would try that and that and that. So it was really fun and very crowded, but like the good kind of, like, it didn't feel like Windsor. It just felt like a different kind of crowd, you know? So not as much of a touristy crowd, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then we just sort of walked around, walked along the Thames and had a little bit of time to kill before we made our way to the Mandarin Oriental Hotel for tea. They opened a second Mandarin Hotel in London, and I didn't know that. So we went to the wrong one first. (laughs) But fortunately, the concierge, when we walked in, I was like, we're here for tea. And he was like, yeah, we just opened a week ago. We don't do tea here. (laughs) And I was like, oh, well, so he called ahead for us because we showed up like right on time. And uh, he let the uh, the actual tea room at the other Mandarin hotel know that we were on our way. So our reservation was for 1245. We got there at like 115. They seated us right away. And it was lovely. We really enjoyed that. It was the your traditional tea, you know, with the the little tiny finger sandwiches and then your biscuits and then a massive plate of desserts. And uh, I tried a really lovely like hibiscus iced tea and Chelsea had like a hot black tea and we both loved our teas. And we were there for like two hours. So just really enjoyed just, you know, taking it all in and, and, and sitting in that ambiance. So it was really lovely. Nice. When, when yeah. in London. Exactly. Exactly. And then after that, we walked over to Harrods. It was right near the hotel. And so we spent about an hour just exploring Harrods, seeing all the different um, like levels and rooms and things like that. And just kind of taking that all in, got some souvenirs. This is where we always get an ornament in different places. And so this is where we got our London ornament. And then from there, we made our way to the Victorian Alberts Museum and loved that. That was really cool. And we just, we had about an hour at Victoria and Alberts before they closed. So we just sort of meandered through some of the different exhibit halls and seeing like the sculpture area and some of the different paintings. And that was, that was a great way to kind of close out the afternoon. And then we made our way back to our hotel. And because we'd had like a pretty big breakfast and a pretty big lunch for tea. Neither of us were really hungry for dinner. So we just packed and relaxed in the room, watched the Olympics this time focused on the, the UK teams. And then once the sun had set around like nine o'clock, we wanted to go see Westminster Abbey at night. So we left the hotel and walked over there and just kind of walked around, took take, taking pictures and stuff like that. And then made our way back to the hotel and we were in bed by about 1030. Nice. So not only yeah. a nice way to close out the day, but your time in London as well. Yes, indeed. So then next morning, our Uber picked us up at six o'clock. And it was about a 30 minute car ride. Fortunately, it was a Sunday morning, so we didn't have to deal with any traffic. So we got to Heathrow at 630 and checked our bags, 
we were the first people in line for them accepting bags for our flight, which I also felt pretty good about. I was like, okay, well, clearly we're here early enough. And so I uh, got through security and everything. And then our flight left at 850 and we landed in Dublin at 1015. And then here's where it gets real interesting. We picked up our rental car, which took about an hour, you know, getting getting our bags, going through customs, picked up our rental car and started driving into Dublin and we got in a car accident. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. So driving on the wrong side of, or not the wrong, the other side of the road mm-hmm. <laughs> in and the other side of the car. Um, it is not for the faint of heart. It was so stressful and just overestimated or underestimated. I'm not sure which, like how close we were to the other lane. And so we hit a bus, but fortunately we had chosen like, and this was, I kid you not a like last minute decision. We were like, let's get full coverage. (laughs) So we had like the walk away coverage for this rental car and thank goodness. (laughs) So the, and the bus driver could not have been nicer. He was like, so understanding. He was like, it happens all the time. It does. (laughs) Oh no. Yeah. And he was like, um, like he was just so considerate and so like, like sympathetic, empathetic towards us. And so that made the whole experience bearable. But we both were pretty frazzled from that. And so we were like, we're returning this car. <laughs> we're not going to go to the Cliffs of Moor. I tried driving. Chelsea, like, we were just like, neither of us is comfortable doing this. So we drove back to the airport, turned the car in, and then we and by this point it's probably like 12 30 and we're starving so we just had lunch at the airport at a little irish pub that they had there which actually turned out to be a pretty delicious meal maybe it's because we were hungry but maybe also it was really good either way we enjoyed it and then we caught an uber to take us into dublin while we were sitting at lunch, I canceled our hotel in Athlone and rebooked us um, for two nights at a hotel in Dublin. Fortunately, I found one with no problem. And I we had also had planned to do the big bus Dublin tour mm-hmm. on this day. I messaged them on their website and explained the situation. And they were like, no problem. We'll switch your ticket to tomorrow. So we just completely changed our plans for our time in Dublin. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So we took our Uber to our new hotel and then we were like, okay, we need a break. So we just relaxed in the room, watched more of the Olympics, this time focused on the Irish team, which was actually pretty cool to like watch the Olympics in three different countries and like see just, you know, how they report on their athletes and cheer on their athletes so that was really neat and then around like seven o'clock or so we made our way out of the hotel and found a local pub and had dinner and they actually had tables outside and it was a really pleasant evening so we had dinner sitting dining al fresco in dublin and it was lovely And then we went back to the hotel and exhausted and went to bed. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rough rough day. Rough day, rough day. But we were ready for the next day with a renewed like plan. And now we were like, okay, well, now we just get to see Dublin instead of seeing the Irish countryside. So that's okay. So the next Um, day was August 5th, Monday. Obviously, your plans before were wiped. So you took the bus tour, it sounds like. Yes. So we woke up and I had mentioned in the pre-trip, we wanted to try this bakery called Bread 41. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing we did is we walked to this bakery. 
we ended up loving it so much that we went the next day. So got to got to have that twice. It was delicious pastries and we really enjoyed that. And then we did, we hopped on the big bus. And if if you've done the big bus before, like, you know, there's multiple stops throughout the city. So you can hop on it at any point and your ticket gets activated for 24 hours from the time you hop on. So we hopped on it around, I think like 10, 10 30. And we did almost a full tour before hopping off at a whiskey distillery. Uh, my father-in-law is a big whiskey fan. And so we wanted to go and get him a souvenir from there. Uh, so we did that. Neither Chelsea nor I care for whiskey much. So we didn't taste any, but it was cool to see and just like, you know, see the how they do it and all that. So we enjoyed that stop. Then we got back on the bus and made our way to Guinness, where I was able to grab us a lunch reservation at, they have several restaurants within the Guinness facility. And so I was able to grab us a, a lunch reservation at one of those. And that was delicious. We really enjoyed that lunch and it kind of overlooked Dublin because it was up on like the sixth floor. So you had a really cool view of the city. And are you fans of Guinness? In general? Mm, I mean, I'm not a beer drinker. Chelsea had, she, she does like beer. So she had Guinness, but I had wine. <laughs> so, okay. You had the yeah. option at least. Yeah, exactly. And then we got back on the bus, finished out the rest of the loop. And then walked along the the river there and just took in the sights. And we really enjoyed, you know, just kind of walking in and out of some of the gift shops and just kind of taking it easy for the day. And then we, that evening, had dinner at a restaurant called The Woolen Mills that we had driven past on the bus tour. And so I looked it up. And was able to grab us a dinner reservation for 7 p.m. Uh, and so had a great dinner. They have like, it was, and it was in Ireland, it was actually like cold and rainy. So we were looking for places that had like heated outdoor patios at this point in the trip. And they did. They had like a covered heated outdoor patio. So that was really nice. Uh, and a nice, you know, final dinner of the trip. And then we were back in the room and in bed by, I think, like 9.30 or 10. So, And that was the end of your last full day of the trip. Yes, it was. Yeah. So the next morning, went back to Bread 41 for breakfast, packed, and we actually decided to, the big bus company had an advertisement for a bus to the airport called the Dublin Express. And we found out that it actually picks you up, like one of the stops that it picks you up from is right outside of our hotel. And so we, it, when it was eight euros, so we were like, oh, we're doing that. So that was really easy. Um, we bought our tickets online and then walked right to the bus, scanned in to board the bus. And we were on the bus at 11, um, which was a little earlier than we needed to be, but I think we were we were both just so exhausted that we were like, we're it's okay. We're okay. So got to the airport, did a little duty-free shopping, and had lunch at the airport. And then in Dublin, you actually go through US customs in Dublin. And so we did that. And our flight departed at 3:20. It was on time. And then when we landed in Seattle at five o'clock, we got to walk right to baggage claim because we'd already gone through customs. So that was amazing. That is amazing. Um, yeah. When when I flew back to the United States from Vancouver, I was surprised. Oh, we got to do the security in Vancouver. And then for months, I've been getting DMs and emails. You know, there's a lot of cities around the world that allow that. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, now, now I know. I guess yeah. Dublin's on that list. Yeah, Dublin is on the list. So it was really nice. And my parents had been staying at our house. They watched our dog for us while we were gone. And so they picked us up and we came home and 
went to bed pretty early that night. So yes. And, and slept for days. Yes, indeed. (laughs) (laughs) I don't blame you. You guys went, went and went for a couple weeks. Yes. Yeah. It was a marathon for sure. And you got a lot done. Okay. I was just looking up the cities where they have preclearance because oh, I know yeah. so many people are going to talk about that or, or wonder. A lot of Canadian cities uh, mm. in the Caribbean, it's Bahamas, Bermuda, Aruba, and then, as you know, Dublin, uh, yep. and then Shannon. That's easy to oh, remember. Yes. And then and then in the UAE, there's one as well. So Okay. Interesting. There you go. Makes it easier when you come back. Mm-hmm. Okay. Indeed. So then yeah. you made it back and then you were sick and now you're better. Yes. Yep. All, all better. And I actually left two days later to go. I'm on a board, a, a national board. And so I had a board meeting. So I left two days later to go to that. And so I think I was still running on adrenaline mm-hmm. until I got back from that. And then that's when I really got sick, but yeah, better now. So Yeah. But overall, except for the last little bit, it went pretty close to plan. It did. Yeah, pretty, pretty close, I would say. I think, you know, I wasn't expecting as much like downtime in the hotels um, with resting, but also glad we did that. And Mm -hmm. the hotel in London, we really loved, like we had a view of the Houses of Parliament and of Big Ben. Um, And so like even just, you know, sitting in the in the room um, and enjoying that view was really lovely. So, and, and, you know, you, you pay good money for hotels, might as well enjoy them, even if it's to nap. So Listen, glad we did. <laughs> I, that's the vibe that I have at my yeah. stage of life. I like a little afternoon break. Yep. It's nice. Yeah. F- re- refuel for his, the, the second part of the day. Totally. Totally. So yeah. knowing what you know now, would you have done anything different? I guess you wouldn't have tried to drive in Dublin? Yeah, definitely not trying to drive in Dublin ever, or at least anytime soon. And, you know, I think one of the other things, and and it's so funny because I feel like anytime I've gone to Europe before, I I do try to squeeze in a ton. And I think if I could do it differently... I, we might've just stayed in France the whole time Mm -hmm. instead of like hopping to London and Ireland. And I love London. And I think that's like, I really had blinders on like, no, we got to get to London. I love London so much, but I, I think I would have stayed in Paris longer, maybe enjoyed more of the Olympics and gotten to see more of Paris because our time in Paris, we, I mean, we saw some things, but it was I mean, and we were there for the Olympics, so obviously that's what took up a lot of our time. But I think I would have, you know, maybe done a 10-day trip and done it just in France with like Paris and Disneyland Paris and mm-hmm. and really just taken in all of that ambiance. So. I think it's, it's hard. Uh, you know, the United States is so big. And right. so when you go somewhere and you're like, it's just an hour train ride, a two-hour train ride, like we have to go. Right. And, and but then you end up, um, being more tired because you're just trying to fit so much into a trip. Totally. And we had several travel days because we yeah. were going to so many different places. Whereas if we had stayed like settled in one place, we we also wouldn't have had so much time devoted to travel. So right, right, right. So yeah, yeah pros and cons because you wouldn't yeah. have seen as much either. Obviously, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, but overall... it was a great trip though. We had a great time. And I have a basic question about navigation. Did Were you able to use like typical maps apps or did you have to use anything special to figure out like where to walk, where to take the train, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I was able to use the typical, my, I use Apple maps on my phone and mm-hmm. it, and you can, you know, click the little like public transportation button mm-hmm. and it picked up the local transportation very easily. I have AT&T and so I had the, international day pass every day. And that's what we use to be able to navigate around the cities. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, that's what yeah. I always use when I go places, but yep. I've not been to all the cities that you mentioned. So I was hoping it would be as easy. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty seamless, which was great. Okay. Well, it sounds like it was a good trip overall. Yeah, it was. 
I appreciate you taking the time to share. It uh, lets us extend the Olympics and, and Disney fun yes. afterwards. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. I hope you enjoyed learning about Julie's trip. I love playing along and maybe planning a future trip of my own. As usually happens with the trip reports, we do have an after chat that is up on Patreon. It's in video and audio form if you would like to go check that out if you're a current patron. If you're not a current patron, why not? We have lots of content over there, including bonus content from the trip reports. We have a weekly episode from Heather and I. It's more than weekly during our trips because we record daily during our trips. Plus a private Facebook group and in-person meetups and so much more. So you can do that by going to patreon.com slash prep to go I think that'll wrap up this episode of WW prep to go For more information, please check the show notes in your podcast app or head to the website wdwprepschool.com. Click on podcast at the top, scroll down to episode 424. Until next time, I will see you on the site.